Hello, everyone, and welcome to Evaluating and Using Information. My name is Amanda Bizet. I am a reference and instruction librarian, and you are welcome to follow up with me directly if you have any questions regarding the content of this workshop. You can reach me at ABZ, so A for Amanda, and then my last name, B E Z E T, at ncu.eu. And so today we are talking about evaluating and using information, which is a very broad, broad issue, right? There's lots of ways to evaluate and use information, but hopefully the tips that are provided in today's workshop will be very practical and help you as you go throughout your research process in evaluating and using information. A major part of the research process includes evaluating the sources of information you locate in your searches. Uh, you need to determine if you are or including something in your dissertation or other um, research project, or if you're going to discard these these resources that you found in favor of more uh, reliable or more recent or higher quality sources. And that requires some thoughtful analysis on your part. So we will definitely talk about that, but there's also going to be a lot of tools, library tools that we use today in terms of evaluating and using information. So the first thing that we are going to do here is navigate to the research process guide as many of these workshops begin um, by going to the research process to uh, look at the content that corresponds to the night's, uh, to today's content. So um, the first part that we want to go to is this section called determining information needs because really the very very first step before anything else to evaluating information is determining what type of resource something is and whether that fits into the specifications of a particular assignment or research project right so we'll talk about this very briefly because some of this may be a review for a lot of you um, so let's talk very generally about primary and secondary sources. That's your, that's your top level, right? You want to determine if something is primary or secondary in nature. And of course, primary resources contain firsthand information, meaning that you are sharing the author's own account on a specific topic or event that they participated in. So we see some examples of primary sources here, original documents such as diaries, speeches, manuscripts, letters, interviews, records, eyewitness accounts, and autobiographies. But probably the source that is most familiar to you all are original research articles, right? Because those authors have conducted a study, they've set out with research questions to answer, they used a methodology, a design, they collected data, and they reported out on those research questions, right? So they participated firsthand in that knowledge, in that research, and reported out on it. That is a primary source. In contrast, secondary sources describe, summon, summarize, or discuss information or details originally presented in another source. So we see some examples here. Textbooks are probably what's most familiar to you all. Your textbook authors, while they may go off on their own and write articles and collect data, in the form of a textbook, they're simply summarizing information from other researchers and presenting it in one giant text that really touches on all aspects of that particular topic. Some other examples of secondary sources are magazine articles, book reviews, systematic reviews, which are actually a very high level of research, and meta-analyses, commentaries, encyclopedias, and almanacs. These are all examples of secondary sources. And it doesn't mean that one type is better than the other, but in terms of your research, your um, dissertation chairs and your professors are primarily going to be looking for primary sources, and more specifically those in the form of scholarly and peer-reviewed journal articles, which we are talking about next. So below the primary and secondary resources tab, so we've established whether a, a resource we, we discovered was primary or secondary, 
and how that fits into our assignment specification, right? Maybe you are prohibited by using a secondary source. Maybe you are not. In terms of a dissertation, um, there's going to be a synthesis of really all types of research with that, um, that emphasis, of course, on the scholarly and peer-reviewed resources. Okay, so here we have academic, popular, and trade publications under there. And just very briefly, um, Typically, this is a pretty easy distinction to make, although trade publications are, are kind of a grayish area. Um, we can divide resources into academic or scholarly sources, pop popular sources, and trade publications. Of course, with academic sources, um, those include journals, academic books, dissertations, any resource that has undergone a formal evaluation process. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they have to use a peer review process, just some sort of formal evaluation process prior to publication to help ensure a higher quality of resource, right? And so with these academic or scholarly sources, and, and we use that term sort of interchangeably, um, they have certain characteristics. And you can see that list here. A high, um, uh, they have a reference list with uh, citations to other articles, defined research questions. They used a method and design to gather research. They have typically done a literature review synthesizing past research. They are coming to conclusions based on their study. They use high, um, they have a high page count. These are typically longer articles than you would see in a popular source. They have scholarly academic language and may have tables and figures of their findings. And so again, peer reviewed journal articles are a type of scholarly or academic source. Um, but not, but there's other types of academic resources as well. Then we have our popular resources. You know these in the form of magazine and newspaper articles, websites, wikis, and these do not go through that same review process. Um, in many cases, popular resources are reviewed by a single editor, if that, right? So like a magazine or newspaper article just goes through um, one evaluation by that editor to make the cut for publication versus, you know, those academic or scholarly sources who sometimes, that sometimes go through a much more rigorous review process, and, you know, in the form of peer review. Um, so these sources use shorter sentences, simple language, so typically written uh, for the non-academic or, or non-student. Um, um, uh, author reports information from secondhand sources a lot of times. Um, there is usually not an extensive reference list or none at all, and usually has more photographs versus data. And then trade publications sort of lie in, somewhere in between. They're, they're not considered popular, they're not considered academic, but they are written specifically for people in a specific industry. And so um, authors can be staff editors, journalists, practitioners, academics in the field, and uh, articles may be shorter, may not include enough, may not include long references. Um, so in, in sort of in between an academic source and a popular source. Again, none of these are wrong, right? Um, it's just that you are going to write most heavily on academic sources and maybe peppered in, uh, sprinkled in there, you might see um, popular resources and some trade publications as well. Okay, so this guide will really go over those differences. So we've determined if they're primary, secondary, academic, popular, or trade. And then typically what you really want to find out is whether or not something is peer reviewed. A peer reviewed or refereed article, you may hear refereed as well, has gone through a process where other scholars in the author's field or discipline critically assess a draft of the article. The actual evaluations are similar to editing notes where the author receives detailed and constructive feedback from 
the peer experts. Then the author has to go on to correct those uh, suggestions or make any corrections that are necessary prior to publication. And so when we talk about peer-reviewed journal articles um, and we talk about things like our Roadrunner search or other library databases, more often than not, you'll see a scholarly and peer-reviewed journal limiter here. And so if I were to do a search here, I'll just search for leadership and um, education. If we search for a topic and we have put on that scholarly and peer-reviewed journal limiter, that is going to ensure that all of our results come from scholarly journals. However, that does not necessarily mean that they are peer-reviewed. There are a certain percentage of, of scholarly journals that do not use that peer review process. And so um, this filter, again, will ensure that they're scholarly. So you're generally safe for the most part. But if you are trying to calculate the percentage of your references that are, in fact, peer reviewed, there's going to be another step that you'll need to take. OK, so here are our um, results. And we have our first result coming from the Journal of Leadership, Leadership Studies. OK, so if we want to find out more about the Journal of Leadership Studies to determine if this, art, this journal uses the peer review process, if this article has been peer reviewed, you will want to copy that journal title and you can head back to the library's homepage. On the library's homepage, we do have a tool here called Find a Resource. Find a Resource you'll find right next to Roadrunner Search as well as under the Research Resources drop-down menu, you'll see Find a Resource. Now, what this does is it's a tool that allows you to search across the library to see if we have a particular journal and if we do, uh, in which years and where, where you would access that. So here is our Journal of Leadership Studies. We have two options here. So that means that there's two different titles. This one is called the Journal of Leadership Studies. In our results, we just saw Journal of Leadership Studies. So I'm going to assume that it's the second one. Um, you know, we would want to double check if we were in a real situation where we're doing this research. But um, sometimes, and not in the case here, we will be able to determine if something is peer reviewed. So this, because we don't see a peer reviewed icon, I'm, I'm thinking that this may not be peer reviewed. But because it appears in Wiley Online, that may be the case that it is peer reviewed. So we're going to keep looking though. Um, so let me just show an example so it's more clear cut um, because we don't have an icon here that says it's peer reviewed. Let me just quickly look for another um, journal here. So I'm just going to look for the Journal of Academic Librarianship because that relates to my discipline. And we'll see here that the Journal of Academic Librarianship does have this peer reviewed icon. So find a resource can be a great tool for determining if something is peer reviewed. However, the catch here with find a resource is that the library has to subscribe to that title. And if we don't, it's not going to show up in find a resource. So for that reason, we do have another tool that you can use by going to A to Z databases. A to Z databases is, of course, our directory of all the library's database content. And what we want here is called Ulrich's Web. It's our only database that starts with a U. So if you click on U, you'll be able to get to that. And here is our Ulrich's Web database. Ulrich's Web is a directory of periodicals of all types, academic and scholarly journals, e-journals, peer-reviewed titles, popular magazines, newspapers, newsletters, and more. So you're not coming here to look for articles. You're coming here to find out if something is peer-reviewed. So I'll go with the Journal of Academic Librarianship again, even though we know that 
that one is peer reviewed. I just want to show you how it shows up here. Journal of Academic Librarianship. We'll type that in and press search. We're going to get some results on our screen. And typically what you're looking for uh, appears at the top of your search results as we see here. Now, um, if a particular title does not show up in Ulrich's web, it does not mean that it is not peer reviewed. It just means they don't index it here in Ulrich's web. They do contain over 300,000 titles, but it's possible that you may find a journal that they don't have information on here, in which case I would recommend doing an online search for that journal to find out more about it. Now, as we're looking at this screen, we see three results for the Journal of Academic Librarianship. If we scroll over, one's microform, one's print, and one's online, but obviously the um, content is all the same. It's just in a different format. And what we want to know is if it is peer reviewed. So this little icon is meant to be a black and white striped referee shirt. When you hover over it, it says refereed which again is some synonymous with peer reviewed. So we know with absolute certainty this title is peer reviewed. If I click on that title, I can find out more about the publication, like the ISBN, who publishes it, in what years, which databases carry it, that sort of thing. Um, but if I scroll down to additional title details, again, I will see right there refereed slash peer-reviewed. So let me just quickly show you an example of one that is not peer-reviewed. Um, let's see. We have one called the Progressive Librarian, which is considered a scholarly journal. However, as we look for that title, the Progressive Librarian, we have, um, let's see, I have to scroll over now using the scroll bar. Um, we see that there's one print and one online. Now, if I scroll back over, we see that that referee icon is not there. So this title is not a peer reviewed publication. So at this point in our evaluation, we've determined if something is primary or secondary, academic, popular, and trade. And now we've taken that next step to determine whether or not something is peer reviewed. Now, unfortunately, there's going to have to be another step involved, and that is determining whether or not a journal that you have discovered and pulled articles from is predatory in nature. So you might be thinking, wow, that sounds kind of scary, right? Predatory. Um, these journals are pseudo-academic publications which exist primarily to profit off employer requirements for scholars to publish. And as we're starting this discussion, I'm going to navigate back to our research process guide and show you where the information about predatory journals is contained. That is actually in our scholarly publication guide, which you can access here within the research process. If we scroll down here on this screen, this is where you can find information about the predatory journals. Many of these publications, not all, but many are open access. They do not provide peer reviews, editing services, publishing help, quality control, indexing, licensing. All of these things are routine and standard for legitimate publishers. Whereas these predatory journals essentially they're there to profit, they're there to accept anything that is submitted to them, and sometimes they're there to take your money. Um, so you actually have to pay to publish, and sometimes they will prevent you from then going on to publish that same content in a, in a reputable journal. So these guys are out there, <laughs> and uh, they, they, um, you know, it might not necessarily be a step you always need to look for um, as you're researching a topic, but certainly as you go on to publish yourself, you probably don't want to associate yourself with predatory journals. Um, so let's talk about how we deal with that, right? Um, so there is one tool online 
which we link to here, called the Beals List of Potential, uh, I should update that, Potential Predatory Journals and Publishers. So let's go to that website. The Beals List um, is a, has an interesting past. It was started by librarian Jeffrey Beal, um, who gathered together a list of these potentially predatory journals, and he got a lot of um, opposition to that and criticism. And the reason for that is that, you know, in evaluation of, of resources, any type of evaluation, there is some personal bias, right? So it's hard for us to be 100% um, without bias in anybody's interactions, including um, determining if, if, a, if a journal is predatory. And so there was some criticism that, um, you know, more open access journals have been targeted and things like that. So the librarian threw up his hands and said, well, I, I'm not going to do this anymore. <laughs> Fortunately, another group stepped in. They wished to remain anonymous to avoid any of that controversy. And they maintain this list of potential predatory scholarly open access publishers. So as we can see from the history, it is not without fault. It is not a perfect science but it is a tool that's there to help you. And it's one of the few tools that is there to help you determine if something is predatory in nature. So let's just see how this works very quickly. Right now we've entered into the publishers tab. What we'll wanna do is if we're looking for a particular journal, we'll go to standalone journals. And here we can start typing the name of a journal that we are interested in. So let's say we found a lot of uh, articles from the Journal of Academic Librarianship, which I definitely would in my field. Um, so I'm going to type that in. As I was doing that, and I'll back up here, as I'm typing, you'll see that um, the list is populated here below. And there's actually two lists here. Okay, so we have the original list that Jeffrey Beale uh, developed, and then we have the updated list that the new group continues to add to. And so as I'm typing, whatever has those terms in it will appear on the screen. Watch as I start typing the word librarianship, nothing remains on the list, meaning that the Journal of Academic Librarianship has, um, has, is not a predatory journal. So that should definitely be a safe journal to use. Let me show you an example of the opposite of what happens when you have discovered. And actually, to do this, before we just type it in here, let's start from the beginning, OK? Let's say we have found articles from this journal called the International Journal of Digital Library Services. I might start out here just with our find a resource tool. And I can put in that, that uh, title. So the Journal of Digital Library Services. So I'm going to Journal of Digital Library Services. So it looks right. Um, that's fine. Um, that means we don't index that in the library. And I forgot about that. So um, what we will do instead is just jump into um, looking at that on the Beals list. So we will look for the, oh, that's why. It was the International Journal. I just realized that. International Journal of Digital library services. I was wondering where I went wrong there, but we figured it out. So here it is, the International Journal of Digital Library Services. Let's say I have found some articles from that journal. That is published 2011 to present, and that is in the directory of open access journals. So I'm going to click on that link to link out to that journal. And here we have that journal's homepage, okay? So we're starting some evaluation of this um, 
title and we see under the the journal title that it says peer-reviewed referee journal so that seems great right um, as we scroll down on the screen we'll see more information about that we see where it's indexed uh, that means which databases may have that and then we start to see kind of a jumbled <laughs> mess of icons here uh, particularly this one stands out to me submit your papers slash articles uh, sort of a cartoon right which doesn't necessarily strike me as very scholarly or academic or professional right it's cute but um, you know some of the more reputable publishers I don't think they're using things like that to attract attention and get you to submit articles and papers okay so let's investigate this more um, because even though it's peer-reviewed we want to determine if it is a, a reputable source to use and while the appearance isn't everything it sort of clues you into that right and so probably where I would go next uh, we can go to the about journal tab maybe that provides a little bit more information this is pretty brief um, then I would go to the editorial board and see you know who is editing this and are they qualified to do so now remember our topic here which is digital library services um, and as we look at the editors-in-chief we see Dr. Arjun is from uh, a University of Law and we see Dr. Kumar is in a pharmaceutical department. So you're thinking a pharmacist or professor of pharmacy and a professor of law are editing a library science journal, which doesn't necessarily strike me as the best, um, most reputable source, right? Something to think about for sure. And then as we scroll down, we do see that a lot of the writers or, or other editors um, are associated with libraries, so that seems great. Um, and so we found out some information here. We've started our analysis, but then let's say we do want to go on and search for that on the Beals list. Okay, so I'm going to put that title in the International, oops, let me go back, International Journal, and you watch the screen below of digital library services and there is our title now the Beals list does not provide any justification any more assessment it just includes a list if I clicked on this link it simply links out to that journal's home page okay so of course they encourage you to um, you know really critically assess the source. Um, they're not necessarily making recommendations one way or another. They're just uh, trying to uh, make whatever information is available here um, for researchers to decide for themselves whether they want to submit articles, service editors, etc. or in your case as students use articles from those resources. I would probably advise against it if it shows up on here um, but you know if something like that slips through the cracks you know it's it, it shouldn't be a very serious offense it's just you probably then wouldn't want to go on and write yourself for a journal uh, like that right we want to do our best uh, always to critically evaluate our resources and that's all we can do there's so many different variables and criteria that we need to look at um, so you know sometimes it can be difficult to do that if you ever want a second opinion please don't hesitate to contact the library we're happy to take another look with you to determine if something is a reputable source all right so so far on our journey we have determined if something the nature of a source primary versus secondary academic trade popular and whether or not something is peer-reviewed and whether or not something is predatory in nature. The next um, thing that we'll want to do is, is more on the individual article level. And let's go back to, let me close some of this out so we're not all over the place here. Um, 
we'll go back to our research process guide and we'll go back, to, well, we'll go to a new section actually. Um, so, so far we've kind of explored determining information needs for the primary, secondary, academic, popular, and trade. And it was the scholarly publication area down here that had the information on the predatory journals. Our next stop is evaluating information. We want to look at set criteria, you know, once we've determined the type of source um, and whether or not it's, you know, peer reviewed, et cetera. Then we'll want to look more uh, individually at the content uh, based on evaluation criteria. And so other schools, universities, and libraries may present slight variations or additions. Um, generally, it is agreed upon that the basic components of evaluation criteria include the following. Um, so you may see all kinds of stuff online, and, and that's great. Um, librarians love to create ac acronyms, and one that was always going around was the CRAP test. Um, I guess they thought it was very catchy, and I think that was for currency, reliability, authority. Um, I'm not sure what the P's are. We, um, so another acronym is SIFT um, down here. So there's a lot of stuff out there, but gen again, generally, these are the criteria that we are going to be looking at. So currency, um, how recent is that publication and is that date relevant for the subject and topic area? So, um, you know, when it comes to your dissertation research, when it comes to um, research for your papers, generally, you know, your professors, your dissertation chairs will want your sources within the last three to five years, probably five years at the oldest. There are some exceptions to that. So as you're evaluating um, your resources that um, may relate to your uh, theoretical or conceptual framework, or um, as they are, uh, like if you're taking more of a s historical look in a literature review and you're really looking back, or if you're trying to find seminal works, that, those works that are highly cited and created a significant impact on the field, all of these types of resources can be considerably older. So in those cases, the currency doesn't matter so much. Another, um, another criteria, criteria or factor to look at is the authority. So is the author qualified to be writing about that? And one tool that I really love for evaluating the authority of an author is the Google Scholar Author Profiles. So let me just, um, let's go back to this first article that we found, and we'll use that as an example. What I'm going to do, let's say we found this in a Roadrunner search, we're liking this article, we're using it in our research, um, I'm going to copy that article title. I'm going to open up a new window for Google Scholar, and I'm going to paste that information in, that title in, and press search. Um, doing this is a great way to determine if others have cited the journal, uh, the, the article, and what other articles may be related. But what I was trying to show you is the author profile. Unfortunately, in this case, no author profiles have been created for these authors. So I'll just quickly do a um, search here. It doesn't really matter what I'm searching for. I'll search for academic librarianship, and then we can see, I'll find a more recent article maybe. Let's, let's go with since 2018. Okay, so if you see an article of interest to you and you're you know, doing your due diligence to sort of evaluate that resource and determine if, you know, the author is reputable and able to search, or able to search, able to write about that topic, um, you will want to look at their profile. So if an article has authors that have an underline under their name, that means they do have an author profile, which you can click on. 
This is a really awesome feature because it's going to tell you what they generally like to write about. So in this case, Heidi Julian likes to write about information literacy, digital literacy, and information behavior. Then it displays all of their articles with the number of citations. So this article at the top um, on content analysis has 513 citations. Her next article about um, information literacy uh, skills for high school students has 365 citing articles, which is um, good information for you because the more it's cited, the more um, people are using that information and the more reputable she seems because other authors are, are taking um, this very seriously, right? They, they value her contributions. So in this case, I would say anything written by this scholar is definitely she's qualified to be doing that, right? Um, another thing you can do here is you can sort by years. So if you want to see her most recent publications at the top, you can do that. So I love this tool in terms of just finding out more like, um, has this author written before? What sorts of um, publications do they write? But again, you have to have that underline um, under the author's name to get that information. So this one has a lot of, a lot of information here as well. That's a great tool for evaluating authors. Going back to our list, let's see, where are we on evaluating information? We want to look at the accuracy and reliability of that content. How do we do that? How do we know if something's accurate or reliable? Generally, the best thing to do for that is, let's say you have found that article about in this case, information literacy for high school students. You actually want to do more research on that topic to determine if any of that you know, information has been backed up or um, anyone else corroborates that or if anyone else cites that article. If that's the case, then someone is, you know, is, is saying that's accurate enough for me to cite in my own research, right? So uh, that can be a little bit trickier, you know, to, to look at the accuracy and reliability, um, but that is one of the components. Uh, is the information research accurate or valid? Can the same or similar information be verified by other sources? And if you're trying to do that process and you're just not quite sure how to craft those searches to find similar articles that might back up that research, please don't hesitate to reach out. We certainly can do that. The next thing you should think about is audience. Who is the intended audience for the information? Is it written for the general public um, or is it written for people in a discipline or a, an academic, right? These are the types of resources you in particular need to be using um, as it relates to doctoral or any other type of research in higher education. And finally, bias. Uh, is that author um, expressing a specific point of view or opinion? Um, when we think about research articles, an author generally sets out a research question to answer with their um, research methods, right? So they're not bringing in personal bias or trying to persuade anybody of a certain um, of a certain point. It's more exploratory to find out, you know, what is going on and 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 so they should not be providing a stated agenda. It should be based on factual evidence from research or experience. Um, and so sometimes this is a little tricky to um, verify as well, but generally as you're um, you know, searching specifically for scholarly and, re and peer reviewed articles, you know, those journals, those high quality journals are not letting in articles with bias or agenda. So you're generally safe in that area. But again, contact the library if you need any help. Now, um, as it relates to online sources, sometimes there's more criteria that we want to look at. Um, especially as it relates to just open websites versus, you know, an online article, um, you know, especially from the library, you don't have to be as critical about, right? But if you're pulling websites, um, you might want to look at this website evaluation 
um, page as well because there's some other things that we can look at as it relates to websites in addition to that set criteria that we should be looking at for any resource. And so um, some of them are similar like the date, uh, but then we come down to um, this one, what is the domain of the internet resource? So that's something that's really important. If it ends in a .org, .gov, .edu, or even .mil, it is more likely to be a academic source. If it ends in a .com or .net, it is less likely to be an academic or scholarly source. And so let me show you in Google, um, because I love this trick, a way to narrow your results just to a particular domain. So I'm just going to open up a basic Google search here. And we'll say that we are looking for information, literacy, a doctoral, students. Okay, I'm just going to do that search here. Now we have all of our results from the open web, over 18 million results. This is coming from everything, including dot-coms. Now some dot-coms, like these first ones, is coming from Sage Journals. We know Sage is a very reputable publisher, so not necessarily all dot-coms are bad, but sometimes you may want to weed that content out, and I'm going to show you how. Right up here, you can click on the settings button. Uh, the settings button has a section called using search, and within that section, we have our advanced search. Unfortunately, they kind of hide it here on this page, but there is our advanced search. When I click on that, you'll see that is retained my search terms here, which is great. And then I can scroll down here to the site or domain limiter. This is where I can put in a particular site uh, or a particular domain. So let's say I only want results from .org websites because I'm trying to find information from professional organizations, non-governmental organizations that may have collected information on my topic. I can go ahead and press search and now my results, while still over a million, we're never gonna get those results down to a manageable number. Now we know that they all come from .org websites. And so here I see journals.ala.org. ALA is the American Library Association. I know that's super uh, reputable. Um, scrolling down, I see um, ACRL, that's a branch of ALA, the uh, Association of College and Research Libraries really reputable organization as well. So this is a really great tool to use in Google Scholar. You'll see at the top of the screen, it has popped in that command. Um, once I'm here, I can change it around. So if I wanted to say now, I wanna look at dot, um, .gov websites to see what pulls in from there, I can change that up at the top. Um, so thinking about that website domain is also uh, part of that evaluation process. So let's say you've done all of this, right? <laughs> We've gone from determining what type of information something is down to um, you know, determining uh, at the article level if something's current, authoritative, accurate, um, what the audience is, if there's bias, and then you know where it came from on the open web if it did. So we've done a lot of work, right? And, and so that kind of brings us to using that information. So we've determined that it is a reliable source, uh, but, how, but can we even use it? Can we use that information? Um, so using information is a broad topic and it also includes your synthesis, your writing, your citing, and just a reminder, the Academic Success Center is going to be this, the department that will help you with all of that, that information in terms of using your information. But today, I want to talk to you about copyright and fair use. Can you use a source? Um, so uh, there are millions of copyright resources online. I want to point out just a couple of them. Um, probably one of the most authoritative sources is the Copyright Clearance Center. And so they have a page about copyright. There's this section called Exceptions 
and limitations. And within that, that's where we talk about fair use. And fair use is typically tied to education because many people in education think fair use means anything goes. Because our ultimate objective is educating, we should be able to use resources in whatever manner we see fit. And that is actually not at all the case in terms of fair use. Fair use is a very complex legal, um, legal document, basically, doctrine. Um, and it is a legal doc doctrine permitting the unlicensed use of copyrighted copyright protected works in certain circumstances. Uh, we have this section about fair use in the US and essentially what it comes down to is that four factors must be considered in determining whether or not a use is fair. The purpose and character of the use. So generally that's what's associated with education. Like are you trying to commercially profit off of this or are you using it in a nonprofit educational setting, which of course you are um, as you're writing dissertations. The nature of the copyrighted work. So things that are more creative in nature are less likely to be allowable um, in terms of um, use, you know, using someone's creative work, like music, photographs, etc. cetera. Um, and that kind of comes down to um, images in your paper as well. So if you're copying an image, you definitely need to get permission to do that. You can't just pop in a, an image that you found online uh, without that permission unless it has um, a open access um, copyright license. Okay, so the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount and substantiability of the portion. So this relates to your papers, because when you are writing a dissertation or a research paper, you are most of the time uh, like summarizing that information. So you're um, paraphrasing, in other words. So you are generally not copying it. When, in the case that you do, you're probably using very short quotes. So the amount and substantiability of the portion used is going to be extremely small. Um, so in that case, you know, that does adhere to fair use. And finally, the effect on the use of the potential market uh, for or the value of the copyright protected work. So in other words, if you publish a dissertation and you summarize someone's work, is that going to affect the market? Is someone then not going to purchase that book? About, you know, a book that you use because you summarized it too well? Probably not, right? It's not going to affect the market. So overall, as you're writing dissertations, um, fair use doesn't need a, a, a lot of time and consideration because generally you are citing things properly, you're using a small amount of a work, you are in a nonprofit setting. So all of those things are great. The only time you would run into trouble is if you are using something like a, um, a test instrument that you have not gotten permission for. If you're reproducing um, images or tables or figures, straight up copying from other texts without getting permission, those are the only things you really have to be cautious about. But I like to introduce this concept of fair use just because there's so much misconception about it that Fair use just means anything goes in educational settings, right? There are definitely things to consider. And so this uh, video here on YouTube, um, Copyright Answers, What is Fair Use? So you can search for that. Um, that is, and I think we also have that on our copyright guide. Um, that is a great, really, really short introduction to what is fair use. So really like this video. Additionally, the OWL at Purdue, the Purdue Online Writing Lab, which um, is a good online source for APA information, also has a strategies for fair use um, 
page, which is great, and it talks about fair use, just like we talked about today, but it's very succinct. And finally, if you have any questions on whether or not something is a fair use, um, you can always look at this fair use evaluator, which takes you step by step through the process of determining if something qualifies for fair use. Just keep in mind this tool does not provide legal advice. It records the information you provide it as well as your own judgment uh, on the fairness of use. But it's a cool tool, so I'd like to point that out. And so if you just Google fair use evaluator, you should find it. This will also be on our copyright guide in the library. Okay, so after all of that, and we've, we've, de we've determined, we've evaluated a source um, to determine, you know, if it is of good quality, right? And now we had to determine whether something could be legally used, right? Um, and then beyond that, um, in terms of, of using information, um, you, of course, need to make sure you are finding and citing things correctly. Again, this uh, relates primarily to the academic success center, but I just want to go back to our results screen here in Roadrunner Search to point out that most databases do have a cite feature. So um, this you know relates to ever you know relates to using information and using it in a legal and ethical manner. Um, so on the right hand side of the screen we can click on our cite button. And then as we scroll down, we'll see that APA citation. Please note that these are subject to error. So the only thing not subject to error is formatting according to the uh, American Psychological Association 7th edition manual. And so sometimes databases get it wrong. This is an excellent, excellent start. And in this particular um, reference, it looks pretty good to me, but you definitely want to reach out to the Academic Success Center if there are any questions about how to properly cite your source. Finally, I want to point out that within our research process guide, we also have a guide on organizing research and citations. So this also relates to the using information part how to organize that research, and we do have a, a video about this as well. The organizing, um, research, uh, organizing research video as well, also available uh, where you retrieve this video. And so uh, this will go over techniques to organize, including using our RefWorks tool. So all of that is, is there for you. And so it's easy to become inundated while researching and um, getting to the point of information overload, especially as it comes to evaluating <laughs> the information and thinking about it in a legal, ethical manner. Um, and so uh, information overload is a real thing. Um, it's hard to know how much information to use and if it applies to your research. So just I'll leave you with a few questions to ask yourself as you are making those decisions. Uh, you can think about, is the information repetitive within your sources? What is the most current research available? Are you including that? Is your older research established and cited frequently? Um, so are other researchers really um, you know, looking back to that research to the point where it is, is of a lot of importance to you in your field? And how do your articles and books differentiate from one another. That's the beginning of um, your synthesis, right? So just think about these things um, as you are get, you know, going through this evaluation process. Again, if you have any questions about whether or not something seems like a, a high quality source to use, please don't hesitate to contact the library. If you need any reminders of any of these tools that we use today, we're certainly happy to help.